People always ask, why is this happening to me? You know, we always tell them, don't ask why, ask how. How can this make me holy? How can this get me closer to God? How can my suffering um, draw draw down more grace to save my family, to, to, to pour grace into my, my marriage, into my children, etc.? To answer that question, why now? Um, oftentimes we see that the analogy was explained to me and I've seen it firsthand down here, the way the cowboys work the cows when, they're, when the ranchers are bringing their cows in. You'll see it, cowboys are coming in, they're working the horses, the horses are all kind of moving along and, and, and stride together into, the, into the, uh, the corral and from the corral into the, into the truck and from the truck over to the meat packers. And you'll see one of these cows and you'll see, you know, the 100, 200 of these things and one of them, all of a sudden he'll pop his head up and you'll see that head and those little ears flop and he'll realize you can see, almost read his brain. He's thinking, something bad's gonna happen to me if I continue down this path. So the cowboys are just sitting around smoking and drinking coffee and they're just having a good old time and just being casual. But as soon as that head pops up, you'll see two or three of them and they'll ride over there and getting back in line. And so that movement represents the interior movement of metanoia in a soul. So once a soul is going down the wrong path, and then has this spark of conversion, which is a response to grace, the grace that's already there from the sacraments, baptism, confirmation. Once that grace begins to kick in, the mystery of grace, and the person begins to turn his life towards God, and he starts to make this conversion, and oftentimes we'll see someone will say, yeah, I, I, this, everything got really bad after I went to an Acts retreat, or after I went to a Christillo uh, uh, retreat. And it isn't that these are bad, um, it's actually they're, they're good, they're doing what they're proposing to do. And they're getting people to make that inner metanoia, that conversion of life. And that's when the head pops up. And when that head pops up, it just draws the cowboys down. And they're going to try to do everything they can to prevent you from getting out of the line. Because where you're going is where they want you to go, which is not a good place for you. They're going to beat that soul back. Whatever worked before, fear, shame. Whatever tactics work before, they're gonna to try to drive that back into you to put you back in line, to get you back in line, to get you back on that truck. And so when we come to us, by the time they get to us, they have fought through the pack and they're taking, they're taking their beating. We don't know the backstory. We just know that they show up and they ask the, the local church for help. And the local church sends us in and we talk to them and we, you know, we try to walk them through this movement and how to, how to fight their way through these um, diabolic cowboys, if you will. Keep working through that grace of conversion because ultimately liberation comes through conversion, through holiness. That, you know, the prayers of the church help, but it's through holiness that that's going to provide liberation. And holiness only comes, as you know, deep holiness only comes through faith and through the sacraments of the church. Prayer, faith, and, and practicing your, you know, the sacramental life of the church where you get true, deep, profound, ontological level grace. St. John Paul II tells us that man has been given an indomitable human spirit. We've been given a spirit that just, that just doesn't want to be dominated by anything, spiritually or man-made. But God also creates us, along with that indomitable human spirit, with the desire for truth. It's written on the heart of every man and woman. No matter what, we have been given that something inside that will fight for what is good, holy, and true, if we cooperate with it. You take anybody, and you put their head underwater and try to hold it there. Every single one of them is gonna fight to get that head out of the water because they wanna breathe, they wanna live. And yet when it comes to the spiritual battle, the spiritual realm, it is very difficult sometimes to wake up that fighting spirit. Many of us have fallen into a sense of complacency or apathy, a lack of care. Moral relativism has penetrated many hearts and many minds. But what does it take to get that fighting spirit back? That spirit that says, I am truly ready for the battle. I train to be ready for the battle. I train to know how to fight in this battle. We do need to know, first and foremost, that we are under assault. The attack of the world, the flesh, and the devil is very real. We also need to know that God has given us all the ordered weapons necessary to engage in this battle for our souls. When you lose that battle interiorly, it will always in one way, shape, or form manifest in the exterior world. You lose the battle of the heart when it comes to an, 
a feeling of anger towards your spouse or, or someone at work, if we lose that interior battle, that anger and frustration and impatience, it will eventually come out in our words, our actions, our behavior, and so forth. You could give many examples of that. But we need to know how to fight this fight. We need to know how to stand strong in the thick of the battle. We need to know not only that that enemy is real, but we need to know what are the rules of engagement with that enemy. Dan, how much power do the evil spirits actually have over us? In, in what way can they really mess with us? Yeah, well, the Lord says that the, he calls the devil the prince of this world, so he has, he has a certain dominion in this world, so, or domination, maybe a better word. Um, but but he also, the Lord also says, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. So, so we, he, has some, he has power, but only if we give it to him. As St. John Vianney says, that the devil is like, it's like foghorn leghorn, right? Uh, he's the devil's like a dog on an eight foot chain. As long as you don't get within that eight feet, you're going to be safe. So, and that would be kind of like when we step over into the realm of committing sin, right? Or dabbling with things that become doorways yeah, to allow and invite him in. Yeah, you give him permission, he's going to come in. They're 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 the perfect predator. They're perfectly ordered, in a fallen, disordered way, according to they were created by God. The essence of the fall is non-servium. I will not serve a God that takes a form lower than me. So, knowing this ancient enemy. The best thing we can do is fight him in an ancient way. So you got to know the rules of engagement. For example, I was out, we, we, we did a horseback hunt, a black powder, muzzleloader horseback, out in the desert on a ranch, and, and I've got a scout with me, he's a good buddy, good buddy of mine, fantastic hunter, fantastic outdoorsman, we're, and, and we're looking, and, he, and we're out first thing in the morning, which for a deer hunter, it's like the most awesome gift, is to be able to see, your, to see, to see a, prize, a prize mule deer with a huge rack right in front of you at 7.30 in the morning, get the rest of the weekend off. So we look and he goes, there he is. I'm like, I don't see it. He goes, dude, he's right there, about 250 yards. There he is. So I start to look and, you know, we're glassing, looking in the binoculars and I see nothing. I see nothing but desert and rock and brown. And he goes, no, man, look. And I look down his arm. I'm looking through the, the binoculars and all of a sudden I see his ear just flip and he broke pattern. And once he broke pattern, suddenly the whole image came out. And I think that's what men need to wake up to, to see the enemy will break pattern. He will break pattern, but you have to force a discipline. Here's what we discovered working this protocol of, this, of, of, of Father Ripperker's protocol, putting it into work in the field, that the enemy responds to the ordering of life, the discipline of prayer, as much as to the prayers themselves. He will break pattern when you force a prayer regimen upon your life and you get discipline in your prayer. You get as disciplined as your prayer as you do about your exercise. When you get that, that level of a monastic discipline and a life ordered to prayer, that ear will flip. You've talked a bit about staying in your lane. The understanding that you, you've got a duty, responsibility, yeah. but it's within a certain lane. Like I, as a husband and father, I have authority in the realm of my wife, children, those that God entrusts to my care. But I don't have authority. Like, I can't pray over you. That's out of my lane. Explain that whole stay in your lane bit. Yeah, stay in your lane is a phrase the military uses. Uh, um, basically means you do you do your assignment, I'll do mine. The lane is your lane at the, at the gunnery range. This is your lane. You stay in your lane, I'll stay in mine. Don't shoot into my lane, and I won't shoot into your lane. So stay in your lane helps us to, rem to remind us that we should stay under the under our own our own authority. Remember, God establishes there's a difference between power and authority. Power is the ability to make change. Authority is the right to make that, to exercise that power. The Greek word for power is dunamis, where you get the word dynamite. It's explosive, but it should be regulated according to the authority of the, of the, of the one using it. Otherwise, it's, it, it just exposes you. It just, it just You're sh shooting off weapons in the dark. You have to, the demon will respond to the imposition of order, but also the exercise of right authority, right? The, the Greek word for authority is exousia, out of the being. Right? You know this word from the creed, como uh, consubstantial? That's a Latin translation of the Greek, homo usios, of the same substance, consubstantia, of the same substance of the Father. So, so exousia is having the authority as head of household. Every man needs to exercise this authority.
have to be praying prayers of protection for my family. That's, that's what the essence of authority is, and the demon knows that. So one of the rules of engagement is he must respond. If you're in a state of grace, does this person have requisite authority? Does he have the requisite authority to command me to leave, right? So when you get a situation, for example, in a home, you got a marriage, you got a husband and wife, and the wife is claiming some sort of authority over, spiritually speaking, over the home and the family, even over her husband, that is usurping his authority. That's not in her lane, and the demons are going to recognize they're that. They're going to recognize that pattern break. They're going to recognize that any, dis any disorder whatsoever they're going to see as a vulnerability. The demon's going to look for the mouth that blesses and curses. It's going to look for the mouth that, that blesses God on one hand but curses his brother. The demon's also going to look for those who are willing to, to usurp the authority of another. So in a case where a wife recognizes that her husband, and unfortunately this can be all too common, is not on board, he's not the spiritual head of the family as he should be, what should she be primarily focusing on then? Yeah, this is very common because you have a, the, the, the first, what, the, way, the way the enemy tactics work, you know, you'll, you'll oftentimes, um, you know, the spouse, the woman is afflicted, the husband is not engaging. So the first thing you have to do is get the husband to engage. You have to get that husband back into a state of grace. So all of our, you're firing all your efforts for that, for that intention to bring the husband back in, right? Um, so, but the enemy's tactics, it's not just to torture this poor soul. What the enemy wants to do is fracture the marriage. So we identify how to get grace flowing back into this family unit. So how do we do that? You get the marriage back together. Um, you get people praying together. You know, overlapping their shields. So they're praying together and providing, getting the flow of grace into the home. Everywhere in our lives, there's areas of grace being occluded or blocked. It's like the hose outside, that grace gets blocked and the water, there's a knot and a kink in the line and the water can't flow. Well, the best thing we can do is to get sacramental grace into the family, get the grace of prayer into the family, getting to confession on a regular basis, going to Mass praying together because the target isn't the wife or isn't the husband the target is the marriage if he can fissure the marriage the children become vulnerable that's the real target then he can get to the next generation so so we'll say look if you're not willing to make the sacrifice of this very disciplined prayer regimen which is the protocol we use if you're not willing to do it for yourself will you do it for your children will you do it for your husband will you do it for your your father who's left the church will you offer your suffering and sacrifices up One of the most powerful stories that always resonates with us all is the story of the father figure. Why? Because we know we need the father figure. Our entire society is built on having a good, holy father figure, a godly man who steps up like Christ and defends, protects, provides, like St. Joseph, like any man out there who has worked hard to provide for his family, any good holy priest out there who works hard to provide for his parish any good holy bishop who does the same for his diocese, and so forth and so forth. That father figure is so important and it resonates with every single one of us. We all love the idea that if there's a woman in distress, a wife or the lady who's under some threat from an attack of a dragon of some sort, to use the term figuratively here, and in rides the knight in shining armor, jumps off that horse, draws his sword and slays the dragon to protect the lady or the child. This resonates with us because we are built for this. We are built for this not only in that we want to see this, but many of us, all of us men in one way, shape or form are built to be this. That role model, that father figure, that, that godly man striving for holiness. Imperfect, yes, but willing to be trained up to fight the good fight because we know it is necessary. It is necessary not only to understand what that, that authority structure is that God has given, but that we understand where we fit into it and to play our part to the best of our ability. Jesse, when it comes to what's happening in our society right now, we see the explosion of diabolical problems, people drifting away from going to mass, the sacraments. Uh, we've seen you know, a lack of belief in the supernatural. The numbers are, are dismal who actually believe Jesus is truly present in the Eucharist. Uh, confessions way down, all of this happening. Um, what is the root of where we need to fight this battle from? This, this root of authority structure that God has given the world. 
because I know you've talked about how these this is an area that's been attacked relentlessly by the enemy. But what is that root where this battle needs to stem from? The root is patriarchy, and and Adam, as the patriarch of the human family, failed to protect his bride. He was derelict in his duty. And so through all salvation history, all the problems that we have are because of men. Men do not want to assume the role as the leaders of their family and as the heads of their family. When you look at salvation history, God has established three orders of patriarchy for the protection of the human race. You got starting from the top down. You got a father's authority. That's limited to the family. That's patriarchal authority. And it's, it has a jurisdictional authority to those under your authority in your house. The second authority that God has established in Scripture is our church leaders, apostles, disciples, patriarchs, prophets, successors of the apostles, priests. That's the spiritual authority. And they give us, they give us the spiritual weapons to fight the diabolical. The sacraments, the seven nuclear warheads, the seven sacraments where the blood of Jesus flows from Calvary into our soul. No blood, no power. Third patriarchal established, uh, institution that God has established is civil patriarchy. The Bible tells us about it. That government comes from God. In Romans chapter 13, there's a whole chapter on that. Our Lord even says in the Gospel of Matthew, Render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Render with God what belongs to God. St. Paul says, Pray for those in authority. Pray for those kings and leaders and those in authority. And so governmental, now I'm not saying that every government official is appointed by God. No, those are, we vote for them or don't vote for them, etc. But the institution of government patriarchy comes from God. And the two best examples of the way government's called to protect is military, foreign enemies, law enforcement, domestic enemies. Those are complete patriarchal institutions that afford a protection. Since the 60s, there's been this, this movement within the secular human mind to destroy anything that has been instituted by God. Patricide means the killing of the father. And we're seeing it today. And then again, we got the attack on, uh, on the man. That started back in the 60s. Pornography was the first one. No-fault divorce. Uh, the legalization of pornography in the big screen. The uh, legalization of contraception, which was banned by uh, you know, an 18th century law, they, Connecticut versus Griswold. Just to show you that, that the man, not because he's better, it's just because it's an office given to him by God. It has nothing to do with men being better. In fact, I would say that my wife is much holier than I am, prays more than I do, receives a sacrament more than I do. Okay, So in terms of holiness, it has nothing to do with who's holier. It's just an office that God gave men. Headship. Ephesians 5, 21 and 22. How important is it that we are in the state of sanctifying grace, especially when we're in the thick of battle with this diabolical problem that we deal with? Yeah, well, it's absolutely essential. It's essential for combat. You have you, you have to be in the state of grace. It's your it's your your, your protection. When a fighter shows up and wants to learn how to fight, first thing you do is say, "Keep your hands up." Right hands on the telephone, left hands protecting all the prettiness. Right, keep your hands up. What do they say when you go into the ring? Defend yourself, protect yourself at all times. Right. So, how do you protect yourself at all times? The state of grace. From the state of grace, you have purity of thought, word, and deed. The enemy looks for for for, for breakdowns and any defects in virtue of thought, word, and deed. And that, those vulnerabilities is what makes us vulnerable. Uh, we're talking about a very, very astute enemy. So I remember seeing tanks, t uh, Russian T-62 tanks, T-72 tanks in the first uh, Gulf War. And you would see, they would the way, the, the, way the, the Iraqis would do, they would put their tanks and they would bury them into the ground and leave only the, the turret showing. And 
but we had heat seeking technology. So you would see destroyed tank, destroyed, but they would also do decoys. They would take a tank turret, just put it on a dirt mound, right? And they would make their army look bigger. Well, this is primitive, okay? So we're, they're out there using primitive tactics. We're shooting smart bombs at them that are heat seeking. So you would see destroyed tank, destroyed tank, turret sitting on a dirt mound, destroyed tank, destroyed tank, turret. The enemy can see through. The enemy can see through what's real and what's not. He can see the vulnerabilities and, and, and attack those. So the only way that you're going to protect yourself is purity of thought, word, and deed. Purity. you got to stay pure. And how is that? Prayer. Pray. Stay in a state of grace. Go to confession. Go to, go to adoration. Pray the rosary. Get custody of the intellect. Control your interior life. Watch your speech. Two things that, that I see often when dealing with cases when, that exposes a vulnerability. One is disordered sexuality, which is, seems to be obvious, okay? But the second is sins of the speech, sins of the tongue. The sin of detraction is a huge opening. You might think I'm in a state of grace, but, you're, but, but if you disclose the sins of your neighbor, this is why we say don't tell your story. Stop telling the story. Get holy. Offer your suffering up for the person who hurt you. But detraction, slander, libel, gossip. Read the catechism on that. There's a very good examination of conscience. That gives us... Uh, uh, a, a great vulnerability when we don't have control of our speech. So to say that a man is truly fulfilling his role as, say, husband and father, yeah, that is when he is protecting both spiritually and naturally and providing spiritual and natural for those entrusted his care. Is that an accurate way of putting it? Absolutely. And I'll tell you, a lot of men fall into one error or another. Some men will just are very physical or, or they, they perform their functions well physically. I have a lot of people in my family say, hey man, I put a roof over my wife's head, I bring in the bacon, I make money. You know what? That's all good. That's all I need to do, Jess. Okay? They fall into secular humanism that basically, as long as I fulfill the needs of the body and the roof and the bed, I'm fine. I'm a man. Then you may have some other men that fall into the air of quietism. All I'm going to do is go in the corner and pray. I'm not going to mow the lawn. I'm not going to, you know, uh, gas up the cars. I'm not going to go get some groceries. I'm not going to, uh, you know, help vacuum the house. Uh, I'm just going to sit in the corner and pray. Again, that's also the error of quietism. As Catholic men, we're body-soul composites. And, and there's a role that we have to spiritually mentor our family, disciple them. In fact, St. John Chrysostom, you know what he calls the Catholic man? This is going to shock you. He calls the Catholic man the bishop of his house. He says every human father as the bishop of his family. Every human father as the bishop of his family. St. John Chrysostom. You know what a bishop is? The power of a bishop? Okay. Doesn't even call us the priest. He goes beyond that. And so... I, I just told, I got two boys and one girl. I told my boys very early on, I said, you know what? I said, we live in a, in a sick, violent world. I said, I'm going to teach you your Catholic faith. We're going to live it here. You guys are going to be saturated with it. I said, you're going to hear me praying out loud, grace before meals, morning prayer, evening prayer. And I'm also going to teach you how to fight because there's evil people out there. And so both of you guys have to form yourselves intellectually in the faith and physically. You have to know how to defend yourself. That, that's, that's basically trying to form the entire man. It's been said in many different ways by many different saints, many great spiritual writers over the centuries, that there is an order to the way we must respond to the attacks of the enemy that come at us. First is always prayer, deep prayer. And from that, action. So deep prayer first, and then heroic action follows. Saint Jose Maria Escriva put it in such words. Prayer first, but action must be part of this. We must engage in the way that God calls us to, in the roles that God puts us in. When David approached Goliath, it is clear, David says, that God is his strength. So David put his faith in God. He trusted God. He had a relationship with God, but he also trained up 
physically to be able to deal with Goliath in a form of combat. We must do the same. We must be ready spiritually, first and foremost, and then engage in the ways that God calls us to in this world with our hands, our feet, our voice, however God calls us, in whatever state of life He has called us to. Remember, never lay your sword down on the battlefield and walk away. There is always far too much at stake. Thanks for being with us in this episode of Battle Ready. We look forward to seeing you again in future episodes. God bless and strengthen you in this fight.